Okay, hi, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Agalia. I'm Eric Meyer. I'm also a developer advocate at Agalia. And um, so on today's show, we're going to talk about something that we've never talked about before, which is a specific browser release. Yeah, Safari 16.4 came out. Uh, and I mean, the release note goes on for a really long time. There is so much in version 16.4, just even as compared to 16.3. This is kind of the amazing thing uh, that, I mean, for years, Safari was the slow browser that barely pushed anything. And now it's completely the opposite. There's stuff coming out with every point release. And, uh, you know, just the top line on this one, Safari so 16.4, if you if you look at the blog post, at 135 new web feature, features and over 280 what they call polish updates, which is, you know, improving things that were already there. Chats are usually about an hour. We could not possibly cover everything in an hour. <laughs> yeah. I So here's the interesting thing that I, I looked up just before the show because I was like... Um, taken by the fact that um when you pull up the release notes uh on like well you went not the release notes the the blog the blog right. post um yeah. so uh the last one was 16.3 that was only in january so like you're saying it used to be the you know once or twice a year kind of updates and we're certainly not at that point anymore we just had 16.3 in january mm -hmm. uh, i think it was like the end of january too um but you know, when you go back and you look at those comparatively, like even on the left bar is the, the author and the date. And mm. the thing that jumped out at me is that, you know, normally the author is like John Davis, Jen Simmons, right? Like it, it's one person, you know, they're the right. release notes for this release. 16.4 is like 10 people, right? Yeah. Listed as authors. There's so much in here. It is just like, an astoundingly big release. And uh, I know that um, there are people who speculate about like why and want to tie that to all different kinds of things. We're not going to do that. Uh, no. I'm happy that it's a great release. And mm -hmm. we just want to talk about all a bunch of cool things. We can't talk about all the cool things that are in there because there's, there's too much, but um, I think it's really exciting to see this kind of energy happening and, and these these huge, huge releases that is just full of great stuff. Yeah. So what's your, like, if you had to pick one in here that you're like, oh, yes, I'm really happy about that. Huh. Like you say, there is so much. I, mm, there's like, well, so I'm going to go with CSS because that's kind of my wheelhouse. That's the thing that I like to do. I think the thing I'm going to go with is uh, the relative color syntax. Yeah, um, that's pretty good. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So um, people who have used like lesser SAS are probably used to mix-ins that do color mixing or a color modification where you can shade or you can, um, you can lighten a, a color by saying something like, I want the color of this element to be this, you know, this other color except 20% lighter or 30% darker, something like that. So you can, you can shade a given, um, let's say a color variable uh, so that you don't have to like compute the exact like RGB or HSL or whatever values for that, um, for that shade or that, or that tint and just say, just do this, like I want you to mix. And that's what the CSS relative color syntax permits. It takes that sort of, that, that preprocessor uh, capability and brings it into native CSS and WebKit, you know, Safari 16.4 uh, is supporting that. So you can say something like, uh, well, what I'll just, one of the examples in this blog post is that you can say my root at the root level, I'm going to define this uh, CSS variable to be equivalent to green. And then later on, you can say, okay, well, I want in the LCH color space to compute a value, to compute a color from that green 
Um, and then what I want is I want the um, lightness in LCH to be half the value that it was in the color that I'm computing from, while the um, chroma and hue will stay the same. So that I'll give you green except 50% darker. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of different, like you can uh, mix two colors together and you can specify which color space you want to do it in, which will affect how those two things are blended together. Uh, I think that's my favorite. How about yours? It is a really tough question. <laughs> um, I am I am like really torn between two answers. Okay. Um, there are so many things in here that I really, it, it, it's hard to even get it to two, but I, I do think that there are two. One is declarative shadow DOM. Okay. Um, and the reason that I think that one is important is because I think we punted it way too early. But, and wait, what, that do you, what do you mean? It, there was an explicit decision back in 2010 or 11 that like, let's not worry about that for now. Let's mm. not worry about how you'll serialize a shadow DOM. Oh, uh, okay. And I, I feel like it has probably affected answers that we come up with and made them probably more complex than they would have been if we had kept wanting to reason about markup, you know? Mm. Okay. So yeah, for me, it's just like a, a thing that I've been thinking about personally a lot lately that I think I, I like that we're finally tackling it and I wish we had tackled it sooner. Mm. Okay. Remains to be seen how useful it will actually be in its first go round because it, it can't do much beyond just serialize the thing. Right. Um, like it can't do what a lot of people want to do is like template and stamp out instances with slight differences and things like that, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but it is really, really useful and, and handy nonetheless. So I, I'm excited about that. But uh, the other one that I'm kind of tied with is um, the at property. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, the reason that I am really excited about this is similarly <laughs> complex and rooted in some history. So custom properties are a thing that I was excited about. They're like one of the things that I got really directly involved in discussing in CSS. And like they were an answer to a better question than the one that was being asked, right? Like... Um, what people wanted was, you know, a, a faster horse, but what they needed was a car, you know? Okay. Um, what, what was the faster horse in this case and what was the car? Well, what people wanted was what like less and SAS do, which is just token replacement, right? They okay. wanted to right. declare a string once and then just supplant it elsewhere in the, right. in the string. So, so they're not setting, repeating themselves. So setting, they say dry. Yeah. Set, set, setting, uh dollar sign bg color or whatever and then refer yeah. to that elsewhere and right you can't do it that that compactly in css but that you can do that with custom properties okay so that was the faster horse and i think actually like i was on the page that like we should give that to people why should you need a preprocessor for that right like mm -hmm. yeah um yep but a lot of the css working group did not agree with that <laughs> uh multiple times yeah. over the years yeah Sorry, I was I was in some of those conversations the first time I was in the CSS working group, and uh, yeah, I, I laugh so that I don't cry. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I I respect the argument, you know. I, I respect the argument. Okay. And then Tab Atkins came up with a brilliant take on this, um, which he still described as custom variables, and it went on for kind of a long time. Um, and then a group of us suggested that they should be called what they are. They're just custom properties. Um, and um, I think that those are brilliant and the things that people have been doing with them have just like blown my mind. Mm. But there's another piece of this that roughly the same time we had this like uh, extensible web idea mm -hmm. and I pushed really hard for CSS to have something to do with that. Um, and my argument was, um, look, the rest of the stack is hackable, right? Um, like the JavaScript, you can polyfill like more or less almost perfectly, right? Mm, okay. Uh, 
And HTML has ways that you can extend it, lots of ways that you can extend it. There's an escape hatch of lots of these things where you don't have to reinvent the world if you want to do something very close to that. And CSS had none of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you want to polyfill something in CSS, good luck. It, you, like if you have to parse the CSS because the CSS OM yeah. would throw things away, right? Right. It wouldn't, they wouldn't be in the CSS OM, so you couldn't use it to get them. And you don't have access to the downloaded CSS in some cases because it's like origin policy violation. Oh, yeah. It's really, really hard. And, and you know, like, right. how do you hack it? How do you make cow paths in CSS, right? right. Like, okay. Uh, so I was like, we need that. Like, I don't know what that is, but it seems like there's parts of that. And, Houdini was the result of all that effort. And hmm. um, a lot of the things in Houdini have gone like focused on mostly not the things I care about, you know? <laughs> okay. And I'm like, well, you know, if somebody's willing to do that, then great. Like, <laughs> let them do it. You know, like uh, I'm totally happy to have the background, the paint, the, the paint mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Totally happy to have it. I just think that there's almost no actual use case for it that I've seen yet, you know? Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, custom properties is a really good one. And a lot of the use cases, they want to have all of the real powers that a property has in CSS. They want to say, like, I am inherited or I'm not inherited. Here is what my syntax is, right? <laughs> um, so that when you right. recall me, I am a color or a length or whatever. So, like, I work in calcs and... Um, yeah. So, I mean, custom properties as we're used to them now are basically just dash dash something equals this. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and what Safari is making possible now is you can say at property dash dash something. And then in brackets, you could say the syntax is length or percentage or number. And the initial value is, let's say zero pixels, if it's a length. And then does yeah. this thing inherit or not? So you really, yeah, now it's not just a substitute, which is what we've been using custom properties for, right? Just to substitute a value, sort of as we've been using them as variables. Now it's really build your own property and define what kind of values it can accept and what its initial value is and whether or not it inherits down the chain and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. Which is, yeah, which is going to potentially get really interesting. Maybe somebody hits on one that really catches on yeah. and uh, becomes really widespread. And then if that happens, then that's the sort of thing that the working group probably looks at and says, we should make that natively available. And so like that should actually be part of the specs now rather than a thing that people have to define on their own. Sort of the same way that, you know, custom properties and color, relative color syntax and all that sort of thing are starting to make their way into the into the CSS specification um, after having been in preprocessors. So I think that one is really super nice because it is um, it is both part of Houdini. Mm -hmm. It is a way to do all the things that I want you to do, right? I want you to be able to plug into the system. And I want it to also be declarative when it can be, right? So, like, mm. it is great. Like, it is exactly where I would like us to land. Um, there is also a, another piece of what came out of Houdini that I think is, like, similarly important but isn't declarative because it's for the other end of that, which is the typed OM. Mm. Um, and the typed OM is sort of a precursor toward being able to get access to, like, the parser or something like that. And it's because the original OM like lacked all that stuff. It was just sort of OM, port a Java. OM being object model? Yes. Okay. I just have to make sure because um, there are so many, so many acronyms. <laughs> yeah. So like basically the old, uh, like, you know, you say like document dot style sheet dot, right. You could go mm -hmm. through and get mm -hmm. right. uh, rules and, um, all that, um, all those ultimately would give you, um, like not actually super helpful values in the end. <laughs> um, because all, a lot of the 
concepts about like measurements and lengths and things like that were like you were back to just like parsing strings. Uh, so this actually gives you access to like all of the all of the web browsers understanding of um, like different units and things like that. So pretty good. Yeah, I mean, me, this I mean it's all really excited and maybe exciting and maybe this is me being kind of an old fart, but kind of a little scary in a way. There's it is sure yeah. There's a there's a lot of stuff. That's exposing a lot of the guts and, you know, how, how, how badly are authors going to be able to break stuff? I don't mean, I don't mean like break the web or break the internet or anything, but you know, yikes. I think that like, if you recall, like there was an era where the web was kind of stuck because I do Safari and Mozilla, they were like, they were tiny compared to the. They were a tiny fraction of Internet Explorer's market share at the time. Yeah, which was just gigantic, yeah. and it had moved on. Like, mm -hmm. they had moved on. They were like, this web is done. Um, yeah, Microsoft had just stopped in that to like yeah. update the Internet Explorer for years. And so we had HTML was developing, and HTML5 at the time was mm -hmm. called. Mm -hmm. And all these cool things, and, like, Safari was actively working on it, and there was these blogs, like, Surf and Safari, right? Like, it was really cool, but it was like, you know, you – you can't write websites for those tiny minuscule users, right? Like, mm. so it's really hard to get people to use HTML, you know, this chicken and egg problem. Yeah. And polyfills are the things that got us out of that. Yep. Being able to say, well, we can make that almost okay. Uh, I think just really helps, you know? Yeah. Um, mm. I, I think it's approximately like exposing the DOM for HTML. Like I think... Okay. Yes. Okay. People, it's scary, but probably good too. Yeah. And I mean, that, that was, that allowed quite a lot of new things. So you can, you can imagine a similar explosion of creativity and, and power coming from here. Um, yeah. We kind of have buried the lead. Uh, well, we you know. I mean, uh, everybody's excited about, um, like push notifications, mm. uh, add to home screen, they even the providing a way for other third party browsers to, uh, like add to home screen and stuff. Um, right. I think there's just so much in here. There's just so much. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the other at rules got a, got a big upgrade at media. You can do, um, ranged syntax now. So instead of saying at media min width this and max width that, you can just say at media the minimum width less than equal to width less than equal to other width. Um, so huge. Like I yeah. <laughs> have wanted that for like so long. And I, when I first learned about that, it was one of those things that I, I thought, you know, like we're just waiting for a release or something like, right. you know, like it, it's just probably by two o'clock tomorrow we'll have it. It seems so, so easy. Um, mm. but it was not, and yeah, it took a while. we waited a long time and I'm really happy to see it starting to land everywhere. Yeah. And that's, uh, so far it's not the first to do that, but it does add another big, um, big piece of, of that sort of widespread support. Um, puzzle which is really nice to see uh i think it's just way more readable actually um, it is i yeah. always like even to this day i still get confused <laughs> with the old media queries like when i'm like min wait max right yeah <laughs> whereas no. when i look at the math i go that's just clear as can be yeah it does it does make it uh, a lot a lot more readable i think um yeah uh they added the uh line height unit uh the lh unit so you can set uh sizes in terms of multiples of line height or i guess fractions of line height there's margin trim which lets you trim the the top and bottom margins let's say off of a block well off of the children of a block so like if you have if you have an h1 inside of a div you can set the margin trim so that the top margin on that h1 is trimmed off so that the content of the h1 
butts up against the padding area of its of its containing element, which can be useful in some cases. Um, but we don't want to spend all of this time on CSS. I mean, there's there's all kinds of other stuff. Over in HTML, you've got lazy loading iframes. I think that's actually really good. Yeah. Um, e even more than a lot of other things, especially because like YouTube uses iframes, right? Yep. If you want to embed YouTube or something, mm -hmm. it's using iframes. Yep. And there's no way to prevent that without using, there are some nice custom elements that have been uh, built around this, uh -huh. yep. but all of them are still managing like a lot of complexity and they're more complicated than they should be. Right. And none of them really are doing this as far as I know, because we have cases where you have just a really long bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And you have videos that are like down at the bottom and it's like, they're just like thrashing all the network because right. you, get to, you get to parse to them really quickly. And mm -hmm. yeah, I don't, I don't like that they're using that when they don't have to, especially because there are people who are like on metered plans or. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and people who are on slow mobile connections or whatever. And yeah. like you say, thrashing the network becomes a real bad user experience. If uh, some, if a couple of YouTube embeds, you know, many, many screens away from page loading are just causing the entire thing to load slowly because you can't lazy load them. But now iframe loading equals lazy, pretty much mm -hmm. like images. So that's a, that's a big win. And that's one of those things that, that that's really great because like add it to your markup now, right? Even it doesn't, and it doesn't matter how many browsers support it or don't support it. The browsers that support it, those users will get a better experience. And the ones that don't, they won't get any worse experience than they used to. And then, yeah. So I was really happy to see that. They got a bunch of APIs that they've added off screen canvas, which I know you off screen do, canvas is really you know cool. a lot about. It's one of those things that you don't, I, I gave a talk about this, but like you, like you don't think that it is important, right? Right. I mean, I didn't, right? I mean, I know that the, the canvas was introduced by Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, like they, they introduced it. Um, yeah. 2005 and, or something like that. Yeah. I think it was 2004, 2005. And, yeah. um, it's cool, right? Like it's cool. I, I yeah. it's a neat idea. And also I've gone my whole professional career where the only things that I've done with it are little like demo things that I, you know, some kitschy little thing that I just wanted mm. to do. Like, and so, you know, you just think like, well, that's cool, I guess, you know, and why are we investing money into off screen canvas is like, I think a fair question, right? Like right. why, why? Well, I mean, you had that demo that you did showing, uh, panning and zooming on a on a Google Map type interface with and without off screen canvas, and the difference was just mind boggling. Yeah, it is actually a really good thing to spend money on, as it turns out, <laughs> right. because while you don't use it, um, it, it is one of those lower level APIs that people build other things around, and then you use it. So mm. maybe your charting library uses it, or maybe your um, mapping library use it or your your games library use it mm -hmm. and you you don't even know that you don't have to know that and maps are like incredibly useful i use them almost every day yeah and they're all rendered on canvas and when mm -hmm. apple introduced the canvas it was all on the main thread because there was only the main thread right yeah and well that's an awful lot of work to do on the main thread, right? So this is tricky because it's not the thing that everybody's gonna ask for, you know? Mm -hmm. It's another one of those, if you ask what everybody wants, they all want faster horses, right? But when we improve off-screen canvas, we can improve maybe a dozen libraries to use off-screen canvas. And then for every user of the web, something that they use probably every day, mm -hmm suddenly gets more responsive and faster as users. Like it's, it's really right. good for users. And that's especially true on lower end devices. Yep. So awesome. So happy that that's, yeah. that that's winning. It's a good, yep. it's a good investment in the web platform. Yeah. It, uh, 
hundred percent agree there. Yeah, they've got a full screen API, a screen orientation API, a screen wake lock API, user activation um, support. Uh, so going back to color, they're supporting uh, wide gamut color in WebGL canvases now. This is important too. Like uh, another yeah. thing we were talking about, about colors, you know, you know, what you don't think about is how many places that applies because we're just talking about CSS, right? But mm -hmm. um, well, it applies to images. It applies to canvas. <laughs> like there's so many places that the the color limitations are all sort of built all the way down to be basically sRGB, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, wide gamut color on the canvas is really important. And I think that these kind of things finishing up are going to be really important to projects like Figma and stuff like that. I'm pleased to see the colors improving across the whole platform. Yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be really interesting to see what designers do with this as sort of the design space wakes up to the to the new reality that they're not as color limited as they used to be. Yeah. Um but uh it's not it's not all of uh, language and stuff. There's a lot of interface improvements too, particularly with the developer tools. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was pretty happy to see there's um, improved typography um, inspection in the font and uh, the uh, the variable fonts thing. Yeah, is really support for cool variable thing. fonts. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you can you can mess with uh, sliders for like weights and widths on a variable font or whatever axes it exposes, uh, optical size or whatever, and uh, see those changes kind of in real time. Um, do other browsers have that? I, this is the first time I've seen that. And Firefox does, um, has for quite a while. Um, and uh, that's the only one I'm aware of. Hmm. So I wonder if any of the people who used to work at Firefox <laughs> work at Apple now. Uh, as a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, I think a few do, actually. Yeah. Yep, yeah. pretty much. So, yeah, that's um, that's that's pretty cool to see. So that if if you're... If you're designing with a variable font, which we all should be, but um, if you are uh, being able to mess with it in the sort of live in the in the page in the, um, with your browser to like, hmm, I wonder what happens if I crank the optical size up a little bit or take it down a little bit or if I change the weight just a just a tiny yeah. scotch. And it's like, oh yes, that is exactly what I want. Let me. Let me go over to the changes tab and it will tell me what I changed and I can bring those values over into my, into my actual CSS so that everybody gets those. Um, but they've got a new pop-up for conditionals toggling. Which... I was just going to bring this up. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I love this. Everything that we do that's like this, I just think is like so good because you have things like reduced motion or, mm -hmm. um, you know, like some OS level setting a user preference that's like, what is your system theme? Right. Um, has, and has the user asked for high contrast. Um, yeah. And some of them you can, code. sure, you can go like, go into the OS and change them. That, but that's like really painful to do. Mm -hmm. um, and there are so many permutations of things that you want to be able to check out. Yeah. Um, and I know these ones are specifically about accessibility, but I think that actually these are, even ones where it's like really hard to uh, really hard to even do something like that. The things that like help you emulate a slow network connection. Right. Uh, I, I remember tweeting about wanting that like a really long time ago. And when we finally got it, I was like, wow, that's mm. so useful. Yeah. So I think all the developer tools that we give that allow, allow you to quickly simulate what it's like for different users is so helpful. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Um, I'm actually, for nost partially nostalgic reasons, I'm a fan of the uh, simulate print mode in the Firefox Web Inspector. And that's the sort of thing that could go into this this new toggle, this new conditionals pop-up or pop-over, I guess it is, um, that Safari has now. There's a, in the Web Inspector toolbar, there's now, a, there's a, icon that you can select and it creates a popover that lets you uh, at least at the moment s switch between color schemes like light and dark that sort of light mode dark mode kind of thing um, whether reduced motion is on or off whether increased contrast is on or off and 
since it's a popover, there's room to grow there. They could they could put in things like you know what media you want to toggle into or um, any number you know numbers of other things. There are other user preference um, uh, aspects that could be that could go in there, and um, I, I hope I hope they keep going in there. Yeah, I love good dev tools. Yeah, uh, Safari is is definitely getting better. It's getting better and better. Um, they've uh, one of their other improvements is um, badging HTML elements, like putting like when you're looking in the uh, in the tree view of the of the markup in the inspector, like it'll have a little box next to an element that says grid, which indicates it's a grid container or overflow. Uh, at least in some browsers, it'll it'll show you, hey, this is the element that's actually causing the horizontal scroll bar to show up because it's overflowing. Um, so they've okay. uh, they've added new stuff um, and and better information when you click on those little um, badges in in Safari. So if, like if there's an event box showing that you know your element has an event attached to it, you can click on that little event badge and it will give you a popover that shows you what the event is like click and like what function that comes from. And is it actually turned on or not? Yeah. As well as the ability to disable it, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and to set a break point on it. I I think that is a really neat, uh, because hundred percent, I don't know how many times I have a whole bunch of JavaScript off somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I have the screen that I'm looking at, and it's like, okay, that's the thing. Now, where's the code for that? And right. mm-hmm. just the ability to be like, th- when I click this button, I, that's when I want to break point, right? Like, right. just yeah. there. Like, it's, I've never thought of that before, but like, when you see it, you're like, so obvious. That's how it should be. Right. Yeah, exactly. There's, yeah, this button right here, something's going wrong with it. I need to set a break point. You can just literally do it right there in the, in the uh in the dom inspector rather than like you say having to say okay so it's this button and it has this id so it's probably being called by this let me go see if i can find the right function that that triggers that and then i can set a breakpoint there no this a will show you what line the function is on and from what i can tell you can click through like if you click it it'll say well in the example they have function grouping dash rules dot html colon 73 and it's underlined. So I think if you click on that, it will jump you to line 73 of that source. So you're right at that function. But yeah. you don't even have to go there to set the breakpoint. Because like you say, in that popover, there's a little breakpoint and a little checkbox it's... that's not enabled by default. But if you just click on it, then you've set a breakpoint and you you didn't have to go digging somewhere else. And that, yeah, like you say, you see it and you immediately think, not only why didn't I think of that? Why didn't anyone think of that before now? That's yeah, amazing. I don't think anybody has thought of it, right? Like I'm yeah. looking at in Chrome, I don't see that in Chrome. Nope. Like I, I, it is the badges thing is subtle enough that you could miss it. And if you told mm-hmm. me that it had been in Chrome for four releases and I just did, missed it, I would right. believe you. Yeah. But I'm looking and I, I don't see it. So. Right. Yeah. Um, how how did it take us this long to think of something like that? But. Somebody at Apple thought of it. Yep. And then, um, God, I mean, there's so much more. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's one thing I did want to mention. Uh, Safari has content blockers. Um, you can have, you can create content blocker rules. And uh, the has uh, pseudo class is now supported in content blocker rules. So, which is kind of fitting because yeah, it was sponsored. The work was unblocked by being sponsored by IO. <laughs> Right, who uh, agreed at Blocker Plus and hired Agalia to do the prototypes and some implementation of Has. So uh, we didn't do the WebKit implementation. We didn't. We got, but, we got the ball rolling, basically. But that is uh, the use case, basically, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It's the same use case. Um, right. So, so that was pretty. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. There's and then there's this huge list of bug fixes that we're not going to go through because. It's very long, and uh, but yeah. there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. But yeah, I mean, we did not even cover like the the JavaScript stuff. Like, there's a lot of cool JavaScript stuff too. Yeah, um, there's uh, look behind. Oh yeah, look behind in regex. Yeah, which is like actually really cool. Um, I 
am a huge fan of making Rayx improvements, <laughs> mm -hmm. giving you more powerful tools for processing text, which is a really common thing, is great. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Um, we didn't even cover probably half of what's in here. There's, we could do another two or three shows, uh, probably on just what's in sixteen point four. Um, and I saw that uh, sixteen point five beta is already out, and it has it's not as long a list so far, but there's stuff that they're adding there too, like support for CSS uh, selector nesting, and uh, some other some other improvements. So we might in a in a couple months we might end up doing another one of these about Safari 16.5 because they seem to yeah. really be bringing it. But import maps are import maps in this one too. Yeah, that's pretty huge. And yeah. uh, some Intel stuff, duration mm -hmm. format. Yeah, international is internationalized duration formats in there. Yeah. Um, some uh, some improvements to arrays. Uh, yeah. In, in JavaScript, like uh, from async um, method. That's a method, right? just a mind-boggling lot of stuff in this yeah like uh, it really is it's really um, really good job safari team yeah and, and good job agalia team who contributed some oh. of these things too indeed uh, but major major applause to apple yeah. um, and good and job to team. tony also mm -hmm. for contributing some things i'm sure yep uh, red hat contributes some things so mm -hmm. yeah but anyway way to go safari 16 4 yep good job Alrighty, well, thanks, Brian. Thank this was this is well. actually fun. I, yeah, I like talking about good news. Yeah, nice. it's a fun thing. Alrighty, catch you later.